I'm really excited to keep the energy going and um, to introduce to you Matt Nelson, who is here with us as the managing director of Presente.org, an organization whose mission is to advance Latino power and create winning campaigns that amplify Latino voices. Matt previously served as the uh, organizing director at Color of Change in Oakland, which many of you might know about, and co-founded several worker cooperatives in Milwaukee, so a, a breadth of experience there. He's also a Liberty Tree Fellow and recently was featured in the first major book on the Ferguson Uprising named Ferguson is America, Roots of Rebellion. So I, I think that provides a lot of food for thought as we go into his presentation. Thanks and help me welcome Matt. Hi, everyone. It's really amazing to be here. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Um, thank you for organizing this, this great event and really important. It's a moment of Prince while we're waiting for him. Did, did you hear that, though? We are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. And black lives matter not just when our brothers and sisters die. Black lives matter when we're living, when we're thriving, when we're fighting for justice, when we're struggling for dignity, when we're transforming these horrible systems. And Prince kind of taught us that. So I want to... Um, And then I can I can take them there. You should put up, put you know, put a, um, I'll, I'll click and stuff. Um, I grew up in Minneapolis, and so I, I definitely grew up with with the purple power running through my veins um, each day. And um, you know, I was a, uh, uh, you know, I'm also Colombian. So Colombian growing up in Minnesota makes me a Minolumbian. Um, and, and I learned a lot about, um, about cultural presence and cultural power and how it relates to our, to our movements. Um, so let me pause this as much as I, I hate to. You should definitely listen to the whole album and the film and compare it with, uh, you know, Purple Rain was in many cases the first visual album um, followed closely by Beyonce's visual album, which, you know, I think is also part of, part of the culture, which we'll get to in a little bit, but I do want to give a, a nod to Beyonce. To start, I think that, um, that there is, uh, that there's a lot of power in culture, and it's often something that we don't think about a lot in terms of our movements, in terms of leveraging culture, leveraging cultural power, understanding that while it is such an extraordinary times that we live in, these movement building times, and there's a lot of presence, there's a lot of presence. You know, I have um, um, you know, Beyonce at the Super Bowl invoke the Black Panther Party um, means something. It means that our movements are powerful enough to get to that cultural moment. At the same time, um, the remedies are something we don't control. So again, in the Beyonce example, um, the way to fight the system is to make as much money as possible for yourself is one of the remedies. And so I think that there are a lot of complications in culture, um, but I, I think it's important to, to kind of look at it as a way out of uh, the current dominant culture of white supremacy uh, and corporate domination. Um, and, and, and I, and, and I want to note, too, that, that white supremacy and corporate domination uh, need each other to survive and thrive. Um, and they, they have never really operated alone in this country's context. Um, and, and I think that, um, that we see it today and it plays out in many, many ways. I know that, that for some of the folks who studied corporate personhood and who've been on the front lines of, of abolishing corporate personhood sort of understand that um, that um, white supremacy sort of gave corporate personhood its ability to reclaim any of the, of, of, of the progress made from reconstruction after slavery. 
Um, so it is, uh, uh, corporations aren't just bad actors or, or corporate domination isn't just a, a, a horrible thing. It's also white supremacists in its foundation and its roots. Um, so let's move on to culture. I'm going to go back and forth here. Just, you know, bear I put this up here because a lot of our um, um, activism, I would say, falls on impact, on the impact uh, realm. And that's sort of when a tragedy happens, let's go organize. When something is happening, let's mobilize together. And I really want us to talk about, to just go back at the system and begin to talk about some of the social structures, motivations, assumptions um, that create the industry systems that then, you know, talk about a set of, uh, of standards and practices that then eventually get to what we interact with every day. Um, so I, I put that, that up there to show that, that how do we then touch this systemic change section. I, I think you do it in part through culture. Part of what we need to win is, is the hearts and minds of folks. And this is, maybe I'll just go one example of how culture plays out in our work, is we recently launched this campaign where folks can, to celebrate Mother's Day, folks can send cards to uh, mothers who are incarcerated. And we talk about, particularly in the immigrant detention facilities, where uh, Congress has a bed quota. They have to essentially lock up 34,000 immigrants every day in order to keep the bed quota. And Mother's Day, you know, in many ways has become another consumer individualistic holiday. And we wanted to hack Mother's Day by saying, hey, here's another thing that you, our mothers deserve love, not cold detention cells. And so through the online platform, people can pick a card developed by a number of artists we collaborated with, and then they write a message in English or Spanish, and then that card is sent to uh, mothers in detention, um, physically delivered. Um, thanks. So that's one example of how we address policy shift through culture and, 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 and culture shift. Um, you know, let me just give a couple, another example. I think that one, ex one slide that I had up here was um, um, marriage equality is a good example of how a cultural shift around um, marriage equality then led in many ways to the policy shift. And it was, um, you know, between, I think, I think in, in, a, in an eight year period, perceptions around whether or not um, um, seems like marriages were okay or not, went from 20 per odd percent approval rating to well over 50 percent in eight years. And it was because of, of the cultural shift. It was because of, of, of a humanizing campaign um, around LGBT rights that was effective. And then, of course, we know what happened in the Supreme Court. But, but it was that, that cultural shift in people's perceptions and assumptions that then led to the to the policy victory. Um, and so, yeah, let me just move quickly on to the next. Um, I guess I want to mention that there is, there's a lot of both power and culture, but also um, uh, getting to the realm of imagination, the realm of ideas with people. Not just the realm of, of action, like what can I do to respond to X, Y, and Z, but how do we envision a new system? I think that part of what's baked in here is, is this process of visioning gets to the imagination, the sort of right brain ideas, um, um, inspiration, pleasure part of the brain that is actually really important for people to continue in, in what Ben was describing as, as facing all the, um, all the uh, repression that we'll face. You know, I spent a lot of time in Ferguson. And, you know, some folks in organizing talk about a ladder of engagement for how we engage in movements. But in Ferguson, it was really a cliff of engagement. It was uh, young folks, like teenagers, who had never really been active before, um, went from that to uh, open rebellion and, and a state of 
of open urban rebellion. And I think that is something that, um, that we know that, that it is young folks who, who have pushed social movements, who create social movements. And I think this, this, this extraordinary time moving into um, open rebellion for a very short period around the time that Mike Brown was, was killed by police um, very could have easily went to wide scale open rebellion. Um, and, but there are a lot of forces to stop that from happening. But I, I do think it's important to look at how, um, how, how a, a, a understanding of rebellion as part of this mix um, speaks to the power of cultural shift and cultural change. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, is, and then I'll leave on a, uh, you know, on a quote, is um, culture also has the power to heal. And when I, when I see my comrades and dear friends, um, even with the latest Beyonce video, seeing it as a moment to heal, a moment to be recognized, a moment to be identified, a moment to be treated as fully human, um, is a really healing space. And oftentimes our culture doesn't allow for um, a positive individual healing or a collective healing. And I think we need that and we can get that through art, through music, through culture, um, in supporting culture makers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I, I guess I'll leave on a, on a, a um, on just a, a reflection on that I think that we've we're we're at a point where we sort of know a lot of the a lot of the tools and a lot of the mechanisms for change, um, and out of all the things we do and we do regularly, I do feel that culture is one of the things that we do very infrequently. Um, but we know that that the tremendous power that it can have in moving our movements toward the structural change that we demand and deserve. So thank you very much. <laughs>